Hi, good morning, good afternoon to everybody joining us today. Uh, my name is Shadat Shadavil. I'm the Senior Project and Program Manager at CIPD in the Middle East, joining you from Dubai. And I am delighted to be your host for this session. Um, today we'll discuss the effects of long-term COVID um, and, uh, and how, what, what employers and organizations can do to support the employees that are being affected by it. Before we get started, and as some of you continue to join us, I will start with some housekeeping remarks. Um, so the session is being recorded and it will be available on demand by the webinar section of the CIPD UK website and shared on all of our social media. So don't worry if you miss anything. Um, the slides will also be made available for those who want them afterwards. Um, don't forget, if you are a CIPD member, we do have a wellbeing support line for members in the UK and Ireland with a free 24-7 helpline, um, staffed by a qualified therapists and provided by our partner Health Assured. Um, we also have a helpline for those who have legal questions uh, with our partner Croner, who's actually joining us today, so we'll also be taking some questions live. Um, and during the session, we'd love for you to submit your questions, your comments, your thoughts, if you agree or disagree with anything, if you yourself have had long COVID or have put some measures in place that have been helpful for your employees, we'd love to know. So submit your questions through the Q&A button, which we don't introduce anymore on Zoom or in the chat box. Um, and engage with the other participants. So to start with, I think it'd be really helpful for us all to know where you're joining us from and what you're hoping to get from this webinar, if you'd like to set us in the chat box. So we've all heard of the term long COVID, but what is it really? According to recent government research in the UK, um, more than a third of those who contracted coronavirus reported symptoms lasting up to 12 weeks and even further. For me, this was debilitating fatigue and inability to focus, mild depression, and a few months of improvements and setbacks. But the challenge of long COVID, as we will see it today, is that it may look different for different people. Um, so what does the research really say about long COVID and its impact? on working lives. Um, how can our organizations and line managers play an active role in supporting employees who are grappling with the long-term effects? Um, and what do we know about the organizations who are already responding on the ground and what have we learned from them? Um, so to answer your questions today on this topic, I'm joined by Rachel Suft, who is a senior policy advisor at CIPD, and give us some broad context about the topic. Dr. Steve Vorman, Director of Employee Health at Impact, is among many other things they'll tell us. Dr. Joel Yarker, um, who's a chartered occupational psychologist and a senior lecturer at Birkbeck University of London. Leslie McNiven, Chair of UK Long COVID Support Group Employment Working Group. Uh, and Matthew Rainscall, uh, legal manager at Kroner, who uh, will not present today, but was here on call uh, to answer any of, the que of your questions that might be related to um, the legal context around this complicated topic. So Rachel, hi, thank you for being here. Really nice to see you again. Um, I'd like to start with you to give us some broad context around uh, long COVID, if you will. Thanks so much, Charlotte, and thanks so much, everybody, for tuning into this webinar. I think it's a really important one. We're now over 18 months into this pandemic, and the world's scientific and medical communities continue to respond to COVID-19 as it continues to evolve. There's new developments and evidence coming out about this disease all the time, including around so-called so long COVID which has become an umbrella term for a long-term condition where people who've had COVID-19, the virus, report ongoing symptoms for more than several weeks or even several months. There's still an awful lot we don't know for sure about long COVID. The NHS, I just looked at the list of symptoms on its website, and I mean, it just went on and on. Chest pain, tightness, heart palpitations, brain fog, depression, anxiety, rashes, uh, dizziness, fatigue. And it really shows how complex and chronic this disease can be. I'm going to allow our health experts, so glad that they're on this panel today, to talk more about the illness itself, its symptoms, the impact and the effect on people's interaction with work as well. And I think it's really important that uh, we appreciate the lived experience of people who've had or still have long COVID. And there's different evidence as well about how prevalent 
long COVID is. I've looked at different studies and they really vary in terms of what percentage of people carry on having symptoms. But what's, what's clear is that many people with persistent symptoms after COVID-19 are of working age. And it's crucial that employers, HR and managers are aware of the condition and we really raise understanding of it in the workplace. Next slide, please, Christian. Thank you. So, and we are concerned at the CIPD that there is a gap in knowledge and understanding and effective support for people experiencing long COVID. Not altogether surprising in one way, because this is a new disease, even the health and science communities are grappling with it. And there is a real concern about job loss if people aren't effectively supported with it. We're a member at the CIPD of the Council for Work and Health, so really pleased that Steve is here today as well because he's chair of the Council for Work and Health. And in June, the Council for Work and Health wrote to all the chief medical officers in England, Scotland, Wales, Wales and Northern Ireland voicing concern um, about this issue and how it will affect people in the workplace because they don't necessarily fit the more typical pattern of people coming back to work after being ill. And I'll allow my colleagues on the panel to talk more about that. And that letter, that, that letter did flag concern about people just falling out of the workforce completely if they're not um, supported properly. But I've just repeated on the right hand side here um, a description from the guide that we helped the Society of Occupational Medicine develop. There's a, it's a return to work guide for recovering workers. And I thought this really sort of highlighted to me um, how this uh, disease is complex, it's different, and it's unusual patterns, relapses, phases with new, sometimes bizarre symptoms. And I know my sister's experience, very much experienced that. But what we do know, let's focus on what we do know about long COVID. We do know that recovery can be very slow and that the fluctuation of symptoms and new symptoms developing as well means that individuals often need to increase their activity very slowly over time if they are fit for work at all, of course. And some people will need to take time off work completely and be supported with a range of different work adjustments. Um, but some principles of how organizations can best support people with this fluctuating chronic disease are still really, really relevant. And it's the kind of uh, principles that we outline in, in all our content, particularly around absence policies. I really want to highlight the importance of absence policies being flexible uh, enough. Often they're not, and they shouldn't unfairly penalise somebody who needs to take long-term time off sick or sudden bouts of unexpected short-term absence as well. And what we also know is that the symptoms can really affect people in very different ways. Even what the same symptom can affect somebody else in a really different way. And so any support that's developed with a, a discussion uh, with that person, because it has to be on a case by case basis, they have to be very tailored closely, any adjustment to support that person. And really running through all the support that's developed, please do make the most of uh, health professionals like occupational health. This is a time when we really need, if you've got that available, to help understand the, the condition. Um, you don't have to be an expert in long COVID, but it's working with occupational health with that individual and trying to understand through that conversation how you can best support somebody. And it goes without saying that compassion and understanding need to be core to anybody's approach in the workplace at an individual level. Next slide, please have to say something about the importance of good people management, because on a day to day basis, we know how much responsibility there is now on line managers to support people. They'll be the key point of contact typically for that individual in their team if they're unwell, on long term sick 
or if they're coming back to work on some kind of basis. And they really do act as a gateway of support for all the sort of policies and helpful changes and so on that that individual can access. And so investing in your line managers, um, increasing their confidence, their understanding and awareness about long COVID and that compassion as well in terms of how they support people is really important. We're not expecting managers to be medical experts. They need to know what the limitations of their role is as well and when to refer to more expert sources of help. But what is important is that they can have that empathy, that compassion, that concern, that they will build a trust-based relationship with somebody so that conversation can really take place. And I think it's important as well to flag that in terms of that return to work process, if somebody is well enough to come back on some basis, then it's not a one-off event because I think often it is seen as, right, now they're back and you know it's all back to normal, but actually, with long COVID and with many other conditions as well, but particularly with long COVID, I think at the moment, it is the start of a process and it has to be ongoing because then you could get a new, more serious uh, symptom uh, coming that the person themselves don't expect. So any review of um, adjustments ne needs to take that on board. Final slide, please. Just to flag, we have developed a, a hub page and the URL is at the bottom and we will be adding to this hub page. We've got some resources already on there about long COVID and FAQs and so on, but we are developing new guidance based on research that we're sponsoring with Dr. Jo Yarker and Affinity Health at Work. Uh, it, it, she'll talk more about it, but uh, we want that new guidance that we're producing to be evidence-based and really happy to be uh, supporting Jo with that work going forward. So there'll be more coming up on that hub page. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I think it's um, you've really highlighted the importance of compassion and understanding, which we've had, uh, we've known to become priorities throughout, uh, but also the very specific nature of, of long term COVID and, and the point of flexibility to which we'll get back and we'll talk about how employers can, can really support people with these conditions. And thank you to everybody who's uh, shared their questions and concern. Um, to follow up on this, I think um, let's, let's delve more into this. What exactly is long COVID? What do we currently know about it, even though there is ongoing research? What, what do we know so far? And so I'd like to ask Dr. Steve Foreman um, to, to enlighten us and, and share a, a few of your, of your thoughts on the, on the matter and, and research, of course. Thank you, Charlotte, and thanks for the opportunity to join this seminar. Um, I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint, you'll be uh, relieved to hear. I'm just going to share a few thoughts with you. And uh, as Rachel said in her introduction, we've learned a lot in 18 months, but there's still an awful lot we don't know. And I think that's one of the things that we need to be very clear about. I think the first thing to say about long COVID is that actually there now seems to be a switch in terms of our concern about COVID. We're now, uh, go, since uh, the vaccination became a game changer, there is less chances of acute admission for those that have actually been double vaccinated. But it's important to emphasise that the vaccination doesn't stop COVID spreading. About half the people that have been double vaccinated can still have COVID and can still transmit the disease, um, although we know it does lower the chances of transmission. And the important thing about long COVID risk is that the impact of long COVID doesn't necessarily um, uh, in any way uh, compare with the severity of your initial disease. So you can actually have quite mild COVID disease. In fact, you may not even know you've had COVID disease and actually go on to develop quite significant um, symptoms in terms of this complex syndrome. Definition of long COVID in the UK, and I say in the UK because that's important, um, uh, there are different definitions for long COVID in different parts of the world, but in the UK is symptoms that uh, may be associated with COVID lasting for more than 12 weeks since the initial infection. And as Rachel said in her introduction, um, there's a huge variation in estimates of the numbers. The numbers quite commonly quoted were uh, one in 10 people with it go, may go on, one 
one in 25 people with it may go on. You mentioned in your introduction, Chair, one in, one in three people may have it. Part of the problem is um, that actually there is under-reporting and under-testing now. So people actually are actually just not actually um, uh, re reporting the condition. But we know we know that less than one in a hundred people will actually go and consult a, 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 a doctor or a specialist. And we also know that the availability in the UK of specialist advice on long COVID is 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 not uh, is by far from universal. There are only 88 specialist uh, long COVID clinics in, in England at the moment. And yet we know that, for example, over 150,000 healthcare workers, healthcare and social workers actually are experiencing long COVID symptoms um, as we speak. As Rachel said, uh, the impacts of long COVID can be extremely variable. Um, and the important thing to emphasise as a clinician is that they may be on any bodily system. Uh, but particularly disturbing are the neurocognitive impacts. So you can have difficulties with memory and concentration and problem solving. Uh, clearly, there's uh, quite often severe fatigue and exhaustion, lack of stamina. Uh, some people may have breathlessness and cardiac problems, uh, insomnia can be a particular problem in some people um, and that uh, compounds the, the, the issues of fatigue. But you can literally have virtually any symptom from ringing in the ears through to joint pain and rashes at the end of the day. Um, and as a clinician, the one thing I would say is that actually we're all different and, we're, um, and particularly we're seeing that with long COVID. Um, long COVID is not unique in terms of a response to a viral illness. Um, so uh, we've known for a long time that uh, some people who have flu experience long term problems following it. And it's, co it's common in, in, in a number of viral conditions. Um, but again, a, a couple of sort of very brief messages. Um, the first thing is that the uh, symptoms are, as Rachel said, uh, recurrent and unpredictable um, and recovery may be prolonged and unpredictable. Um, and as an occupational physician and as a senior occupational physician, I know how frustrating it is when an employer gets that medical report that says, um, well, I think this person has got issues, but I can't tell you when it's going to get better. And I can't tell you what they're going to be able to do on Monday. Indeed, I can't tell you what they're going to be able to do three months from Monday. But I can tell you actually and give you some advice about uh, aiding and assisting their recovery. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to say recovery, um, because from what we know, long COVID is, it, whilst it can be a very long tail disease, and we're still seeing people that uh, still have significant disability that have actually had the symptoms right from the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, but we, from all we can predict as clinicians, the likelihood is that there will be a recovery. Uh, that in itself can give problems with HR management and HR policies. Um, and Rachel mentioned uh, the fact that uh, uh, via the Council for Work and Health, we've been quite concerned about the fact that many uh, HR policies on sickness absence management and particularly particularly policies on ill health retirement and support actually don't deal well with long COVID because um, uh, particularly of, of the issues around uh, uh, whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent or, permanent or not. But it is clear that employers are going to have to think about the fact that many people will need adjustments to their work. Uh, we know that this is a very common disease. We know it's going to be increasingly common disease going forward. Um, and I think it, the key in all of this is to understand individual needs and to be flexible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think there are a few questions that spring to my mind. The first one you've said is, um, uh, as we know, you might even know you've had long COVID as the, the, the long, having long COVID is not related with how mild or not your case was. Then for employees who wouldn't even have been uh, diagnosed, and I guess my question is to the panel, but for employees who wouldn't even have been diagnosed with COVID in the first place, but who are suffering from long-term COVID, um, and that might, be, that might be revealed later or might not, because it might even be too late to find out antibodies, what can employers do and can it really can can we really diagnose them and how do we support these people um 
I think the issue of not knowing whether you've got, got the label or not got the label is quite an important one. Uh, and increasingly, I'm interested in a sick presence. And I think that we are going to be seeing people that are underperforming in the workplace that actually are having significant issues that maybe haven't got the capacity that they previously had, that will never have had a test or will never have had a clinical diagnosis of long COVID, but actually are going to impact on workforce capability and are going to need managing in the workplace in the workplace. Um, as I said earlier on, uh, we know that less than one in a hundred that actually think that they've got long COVID will actually seek medical support. And we know that the diagnostic process of uh, of putting that long COVID label on is not an exact science by any means. So again, I, I think this is like any other long, long term fluctuating condition where um, the important thing is for employers to be uh, more flexible in asking workers what they need and then being able to respond to it. Yes, um, thank you. And we'll get to policies in, in a bit. Um, you've also used earlier uh, the word something that we discussed offline right before. You've used the word disability. Can long COVID, is it a disability? Can it, can it be classified as one and in which case? And so I'll ask you, but I think um, Leslie, you were talking about this earlier and perhaps Matthew to weigh in on that as well. Yes, um, I, I, I wouldn't claim to be a lawyer, but I've been involved in very many disability cases in terms of uh, un understanding what is a disability. And I think there's no question that long COVID, um, from the multiplicity of its symptoms and the severity of its symptoms, can have an impact on day-to-day -day activity. And we're now, all, now, we're now seeing many cases that have lasted past a year. So I suspect an employment tribunal or a court would actually consider it that it could be a disability and it's wise to treat it as such. Uh, I don't know if Matthew wants to say anything. Only to agree, really. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when you're looking at it from an employment law point of view, I mean, the, the, the test is whether there's a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on a person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, and as we know, it's always a question of fact and degree in that particular case with that particular claimant as to how the tribunal would determine whether that threshold's been reached. I think in some circumstances where it's very minor, very low level, uh, sort of long COVID, then it, it may not be. But I think in the vast majority of cases, and certainly where we're talking about things like fatigue, um, cognitive impairments and so on and so forth, it's, it's likely to be. Um, an important point though as well, you mentioned, Steve, in terms of the label being important for individuals and, and sort of how they uh, address it and how they manage it themselves and seek support and treatment. Interestingly, from a legal point of view, it isn't actually a medical diagnosis that the tribunals are looking for. Um, it is literally just how does it affect that person and their ability from a really a common sense point of view to be able to carry out their normal day to day activities. And I I think the day-to-day -day activities one is a really important point because I'm certainly seeing people that are functioning relatively well at work but are literally going home and collapsing at home and are unable to do the housework or the shopping uh, uh, and or the cooking. Yeah, and it's taken in the round. I mean, in terms of dealing with it through a, a claim point of view, I mean, the tribunal will ask the claimant to produce a, an impact statement uh, where they explain the effect that it's having um, and then produce their medical evidence as well. The respondent, the employer, will potentially be arguing in the alternative. Unfortunately, it gets a little bit cynical at this stage of the process. Um, but um, and then the tribunal will basically weigh up that one way or the other, potentially with medical expert evidence if, if they feel as though that's appropriate in that particular case. But otherwise, it is very much you know how is it affecting you and 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 and, and what, what are the symptoms? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, um, um, Matthew. Um, I think it was, it was quite important to clarify this, but we will get back into legal questions if anybody has further ones towards the end of the session. Um, so we've said uh, this, the, the definition of, of long COVID varies, the symptoms vary too. It's quite difficult to diagnose and we're still learning a lot about this. Um, but we do know that we need to, to, to implement flexible policies and we have learned quite a bit as well. So um, I'd now like to get into uh, what many of you are asking about, which is how exactly can line managers and employers support these employees who are suffering from the symptoms? Um, and to start, I'd like to invite Dr. Jo Yarker um, to, to take us through a bit of your, of, of your thinking and, and the research and findings of the research around long COVID. Fantastic, thank you. So thank you. 
In terms of our, um, our research, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see this picture of an, an igloo, which some of you, if you've um, read the new guidance uh, for long-term conditions and managing, managing long-term absence, you'll, you might be familiar with. But the perspective that, that we've developed through our research is really that often when we're dealing with absence and when we're supporting people back from a return, we operate in silos. So we expect the individual to take on board lots of different exercises to rehabilitate themselves and, and um, get stronger so that they can go back to work. We expect things of the leader and the line manager. We expect these, these policies to fall into place. But actually what we need to really do is think of these in a really synergistic way and build a protective shield for the individual so that they can have the, the best possible return to work or stay at work experience such that we're really responding in a joined up way to their needs. And so the project that I'm going to share just to, some top line findings from is drawing from work that we've been doing, looking at mental health in the workplace and how we can support people to stay at work when they've been for, when they've been experiencing significant mental health challenges. And we thought actually this model is really helpful in the context of understanding the needs of people with long COVID. And so on the next slide, we'll have just a little bit of a, a picture here that you can see is obviously Steve's talked through some of the, the facts and figures behind this, but what really comes through is that there are too many experiencing um, long COVID that we really need to have in place some practical solutions. But also for many of the stories that we hear, people are off work for, for a long time. And we know that the longer people that stay off work, the less likely it is that they're going to be able to return. So with such a high volume of people experiencing challenge of, of managing their, their condition at work, we really need to be able to put in place um, processes and practices that will enable people to manage work in the long run and stay at work such that they can work at their capacity in a flexible way. So it really does link into all that Rachel was saying and, and Steve was saying about that, that flexibility and adjusting work so that it can map into that fluctuating condition. But what we also see is often managers have no idea what to say. They don't know really what's presenting in front of them. And as Steve was saying, this idea of, of sit presenteeism, sometimes you might miss it as perhaps poor performance or not being attentive to the detail when actually there's something else going on. And as a manager, sometimes you don't feel confident in, in addressing that. As the individual who's experiencing the health condition, whole wave of these new emotions and and symptoms and, and physical symptoms that are really unfamiliar and not knowing how to deal with that. And so often what we see is managers are unsure of what to do or say, and they don't know how to make adjustments and how to make adjustments work. Employees themselves are unsure of what to say or what to do because it's all new to them as well. So um, what we've aimed to do is understand from those people who have got back to work and are managing work successfully, what does that look like and what do they need? And so we look at everything in terms of what are the individual resources and individual things that people need to do to get themselves back into work and sustain work, but also what do we need from our group, from our colleagues, from our line manager and from our organisational level response. And so if we go on to the next slide, I'm only going to fly through these very quickly and we'll hopefully um, share them share them in the next next couple of months when we've fleshed out the findings in more detail but what we've heard from individuals is the things that can be really helpful for them is that coming to terms with reduced work functioning it's incredibly hard to go from full steam managing home and work life to suddenly your body not allowing you to to operate in that same sustained way and so for for individuals helping themselves come to terms and accept that they perhaps cannot work or live at the pace that they were is something that's very hard, but something that helps them on that journey to having more open conversations and better managing their health and well-being. And this point about being open about their work functionality um, is really important because what we see here is that many people describe that as being so hard to, to describe what they feel able to do, but necessary to really then achieve those work adjustments that are useful. As with mental health, as with so many other conditions, prioritizing self-care is absolutely key. And those individuals that prioritize their self-care and are afforded that from their group, from their, their line manager, are also those that are able to sustain their health and well-being because 
as many people with, with long COVID um, describe, often it's two steps up and one step back. You think you're better, so you push yourself a little bit more and then actually that exhaustion steps in and it's one step back. So the prioritizing the self-care is absolutely key. So at the group level, if we move on to the next slide, we can see here individuals found from their colleagues and their friends some really useful things. So having instrumental support when they're at work. So people stepping in and saying, can I help you with that spreadsheet? Or you've got a presentation to do. Do you want me to stand near with you? Is there anything that I can do to help you prepare? Really stepping in to, to give that support when needed and recognizing that people will need to take their work at pace. So it's not going to be the same as it was perhaps before they, um, they experienced COVID. There will be times where there will be a need for a step back and perhaps as a colleague, the need to step in. And then from family and friends also needing that, that emotional social support. This has been a, a significant change for many people. And many of those aspirations of how life is going to be over the next few months have been dramatically changed and curtailed. And so having that emotional support is really key. And connecting with outside work activities. For many people, we hear from people working in the health profession, teachers, all sorts of occupations where work has often been the main focus of life. And when that work capacity is reduced, we need to think about what are those other activities that can restore us so that we can then manage our, our health and our work. And then the line manager, so much is put on the line manager. And at the next slide, what we can see is some of the things that have been mentioned from those individuals that have been kind enough to share their stories is the absolute um, vital role of an extended phase return. So far too often people have tried to get back to work um, within that traditional six weeks and, and that just doesn't work for so many people with long COVID. So an extended phase return that's, um, that the manager has the, um, the autonomy to, to flex and, and work with the individual. But also making sure that we can flex those tasks, offer home working where it's available um, and giving that, that manager the autonomy to flex the work adjustments week by week without having to check in with somebody more senior so that they can really respond on a day-to-day -day basis to help meet the team goals, but also help the individual manage their health and work. What I think is striking and really echoes what Steve was saying there about the lack of expert support in this area is when we look outside to that leadership that often, if you are, say, for example, experiencing mental ill health, you might go to your GP, there's certainly a lack, it seems that there's a lack of immediate support for somebody with long COVID to go and access. And for me, that, that means in an organizational situation, it's ever more important to have occupational health, to have a, a good um, health provision so that your employees can act on that. And then when we look at the organizational level, some of the themes that are coming through here are those flexible work practices, having strong leave policies, and also that culture where mental health and physical health are prioritized. So if as an organization, you know that there is a stigma around men, uh, mental health, it's likely that your employees with long COVID are going to face challenge as well. So looking at mental health and physical health in the round is really, is really key there. And efforts that you can put in to supporting that open dialogue about health and, and work is really, is really going to be a benefit. And outside, it's thinking about where we can help to access um, health and advice. So for those organizations um, that don't have occupational health, do you know where your local long COVID clinic is? Are you able to provide them with information that, that can support them in other ways? And that, that is often seen as really helpful. So that's a whiz bang tour of, of what we found so far. And we're really at those early stages of delving into, into research and, and stories that we've been so privileged to hear from people who've been sustaining their work over time. On the next slide, I just want to highlight really this role of the fact that in practice, everybody's got a, a role to play in supporting those individuals return to work. The individual themselves needs to build up those um, that toolkit that's going to help them sustain their, their work and health, but also line managers, colleagues, and our organizational professionals. And this igloo approach really helps us to identify, okay, what is it that I can do 
in my position to, to play a role in that journey. So we need to increase our knowledge, our skills, our confidence so that we can help people return back into work. But also we need lots more research. We need to understand what people's experiences are, not only in terms of that lived experience, but also what's the experience of supporting people? How, what works, what doesn't, what kind of messages are, are you finding as HR practitioners um, land with your managers to help them exercise their extra support? How do you build a, a supportive culture and one where adjustments are made and, and realized? And so that's where um, we'd like to do a quick call for, for research as well, because we're going to be running some roundtable discussions over October. And if you have um, anybody, uh, any experience of managing those with long COVID, if you are rolling out processes and reviewing your absence management policies to, to think about how you can better support people, we'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to take part in any of those round tables, please do get in touch. And um, my email address is there and also um, Rachel's if you if you have any questions and we'll, we'll send out some further information at that point. Thank you, Joe. I just dropped uh, your contact and um, Rachel's in the chat for anybody who wishes to get in contact. Um, it'd be great to do this in the chat, but we won't be able to capture it. So, so that will be quite helpful and um, we'll, get, we'll have the guidance soon. Do you have a timeline for this so people can look out for it, for the new guidance coming out? So towards the end of the year, we're aiming for, for the full report and new guidance to come out. So in the meantime, I think um, the the um, revised absence management um, guidance is a, a really good first step um, because it really helps to focus that mind on how do we think about fluctuating conditions, but the long COVID research will obviously provide much more depth. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go on with our next speaker and then I too want to come back to you and talk about absence management policies and attendance as this is the most questions we've received in the chat. Um, so kind of to bring it all together and talk about the work of the UK Long COVID Support Employment Working Group um, and lived experiences, I'd now like to invite uh, Leslie McNiven, who's the chair of, of that working group. Um, Leslie, if you'd like to share a couple of thoughts and kind of help us bring this all together, that'd be lovely. Sure. I'm, I'm loving that the person in the room with the lived experience of long COVID and the brain fog is the one that's trying to pull it all together. But actually, I think I can probably say some useful things about um, how patient groups are doing exactly that. So thank you to the CIPD for the invitation. Apologies, I'm a bit croaky today. Um, and I completely endorse everything that has been said by the previous speakers, which might, does make my life an awful lot easier. Um, we are very um, much part of the story um, and what people with long COVID have done in the last 18 months is basically organise ourselves so that we go from purely being passive patients who need to be helped and fixed to thinking how can we be active participants in our own recovery um, as you've heard from people like Steve. So I wanted to speak to you um, about this theme of how we all work together because multidisciplinary working is what, from a medical perspective, is being found we need to be doing to treat long COVID from a medical perspective. But as has been said by other speakers, it's also how we need to work collaboratively to create that protective shield that Joe talked about for the system to join up, to support the patient or the worker, to be able to work their way through the system whilst ill. So the first hat I'm wearing is, I'm a person living with the lingering effects of long COVID. Um, I contracted COVID-19 in March 2020. Fortunately, I have a very understanding employer. I'm self-employed. Um, I had two children at home. I was homeschooling and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to rest and I will recover quickly if I do the right things. And uh, here I am 18 months down the line, a lot better than I was, but still very much pacing and still very much recovering, but also very much contributing. In my um, life in the last 18 months, my preoccupation hasn't been what the, the projects I was working on pre-COVID, which were very much around gender inequality in the workplace, but much more campaigning for rehab research and recognition um, alongside other people who have found themselves in limbo and becoming patient activists, because um, recognition um, has been touched on. 
people didn't even realize long COVID was a thing until patients noticed what was happening, talked to each other and started doing patient-led research. So this is something that's been um, identified and named by patients. So we call it long COVID, not the medical term, because this is how it's felt for us is that we've been affected by long COVID, not SARS COVID 2.957 or whatever it is. Um, but my third um, hat that I'm very much wearing today is the fact that I am a CIPD fellow. I've been a member of the CIPD for 20 years. Um, I had 20 years experience doing um, culture change and OD work within very large organizations including a FTSE 100 company. So my passion um, in those roles was very much trying to fix problems and optimize how we develop, retain, attract and support our talent. Um, and I think I'm looking at the long COVID conundrum and the returning to work challenges very much with that perspective. It's very much about behavior led change management and strategic HR. And I agree um, with what was just said there about occupational health have a huge role to play. Managers have a huge role to play. HR have a huge role to play. But patients have a huge role to play as well, both as individuals and as collectives. So I call this workers with long COVID experts by experience because this is how the National Institute for Health Research, who has funded millions of pounds of research into um, what long COVID is and how we tackle it, um, have consulted patients as part of the process of evaluating what needs to be done and who we want to give funding to, to find these answers. And they very much see our role as being crucial. Um, so more on that as we go through. But I very much um, appreciate the fact that I already know majority of people in this call today. We've already been working together. So the Lung Patient Group has formed lots of allies and we are working in this multidisciplinary collaborative way. And I think it's just extending that into organisational practice because I spent a long time designing and delivering management development programmes and coaching line managers and middle managers, the squeezed middle. And I know it's a thankless task often and it's a hard task. And it's not just about um, expecting managers to be able to do everything by themselves and become experts. Can I get the next slide, please? So this was an illustration done by one of our colleagues who has long COVID, who is a gifted artist. Um, and in the early days, and I have shared a blog post in the chat, that I wrote in March this year, reflecting on what the first six months of uh, the pandemic were like if you contracted COVID. You were basically told to wait at home and be patient. We're dealing with all the acute cases in the hospitals. We can't overwhelm the NHS. So we became our own case managers, our own researchers. And you know, most people could tell you, I'm at day whatever. And we started off the first iteration of this cartoon had people saying day 30, day 40. We had to update it to do that. Now we're looking at 500 days plus for people who got COVID in the first wave. So, you know, that goes to show without any support or treatment, I suspect some people who are still recovering now may have recovered more quickly, but that's, that's my own perspective on it. And th there wasn't research being done and support being given back at, um, at that stage. So it's also important to note that People with long COVID got long COVID at different points in the pandemic. We've had a first wave, a second wave and a third wave. Um, people getting long COVID now may well end up in a clinic um, ahead of people who contracted COVID in March and April 2020. Um, in Scotland recently, I looked at the stats um, when I was giving evidence to some MSPs. Um, a third of people with long COVID in Scotland have been ill for over one year. Um, there is a real concern we get left behind um, because there was no treatment there was no support we didn't know what was happening and that was no one's fault that was just the reality at the time uh, next slide please so the patient group that i started moderating um, back in may june 2020 now has 44,000 members and it's called long COVID support and we're forming a charity to get funding so that we can better um, work with people trying to find solutions. As Steve outlined, people experience debilitating symptoms, sometimes months after infection. I had a very mild case, and that's why I was moderating the group, because I thought I was one of the lucky ones who'd recovered. And uh, sadly, 
it came and bit me on the backside. Um, but it was really important that some of the things that Joel was talking about there, about feeling that supportive shield, in the absence of anyone knowing about long COVID or expecting long COVID, we created that shield within patient groups. Um, one of the quotes, at least I know I'm not alone. Um, I think people who actually have had the disease tend to know a little bit more about it. And I actually think support group has given me more knowledge than the doctors. There were no experts. There even now are very few experts um, who knew all things about long COVID. I'm pretty sure Steve said something to that effect about we have to remember how much we still don't know. So the good news is that passive patient who you're thinking how do I fix them how do I fix this problem how do I help this person um, they've probably given a lot more thought to that than you <laughs> um, another thing I'm noticing somebody saying about how can I distinguish long COVID and languishing you know the, the, the torpor generated by lockdown again I think the patients themselves do not wish to prolong the feeling that we are not capable of doing the key things that made us us. Um, and I think, again, just listening and believing what people are saying um, is really useful. And that's the very first thing that people find when they join the support group is we didn't judge, we didn't have any answers, but we listened and we shared and we started to try things and experiment and what worked was shared and what didn't work was shared with the caveat that just because it worked for me, it might not work for you. But, you know, we, we have done lots of reasonable adjustments already in our um, lives. Uh, next slide, please. So I came into this as an HR and change management professional and occupational health was something I knew that we sometimes used in HR for people um, who needed a bit of extra support. But I've come to realize just how underutilized occupational health has been in the context of long COVID and how much more we could benefit from additional occupational health support. And I went along to a summit by the Society of Occupational Medicine, who I've been working with since January um, as partners in producing guidance with people like Joe and Claire Rayner, one of the doctors in our employment working group. And there's an issue about access, only about 50% of people can have access to occupational health. The quality of the occupational health being provided is sometimes um, kept as quite minimal when actually it could be an investment in finding solutions and used much more in depth. But also the scope, we've got occupational physicians, we've got occupational health nurses, um, but we've also got occupational therapists and we have several occupational therapists in our employment working group, which is, um, a subset of the steering group that I'm part of for long COVID support, who are trying to influence strategically how patients can be part of the solution and part of co-creating the design of pathways to recovery. And it, this was a light bulb moment for me early on um, when I saw this definition of occupational health is about preventing departures from health. As Steve said, the shift, we've, we've shifted perspective. We are now tolerating infection risk teachers are having to um, go into classrooms with uh, children. One child gets ill, following week 17 are off, and that teacher has been exposed to the viral load of 17 children. And, you know, that is just being seen as something we're having to live with, to live with COVID. And in Scotland, at least, we're doing a lot more preventative measures in the classroom, but we do not seem to be managing the risk of COVID and long COVID um, in particular terribly well. And the final point, this adaptation of work to people, what a different way to look at how we organise ourselves post pandemic. Before HR was very much about writing job descriptions and fitting someone into the job description through interviews. Why don't we look at the resource we have and how we can fit what we need to be delivering as a team based on the capacity of the people within that team. Um, and that for me is a call to action to not write off someone who is underperforming. I know a lot of people who've not had COVID and long COVID who are underperforming because of other depression, um, anxiety and concerns that have come about, not to mention being at home, managing ill people, potentially looking after children who've got COVID and long COVID. You know, no one has not been touched by the pandemic. Any, any semblance of idea that people are normal 
in this current state of affairs is, is probably fairly unrealistic. So let's get real about what, how we actually deal with people and what they can do in, in the day-to-day -day from a realistic perspective. Um, next slide, please. So the NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, they commissioned a survey of um, what evidence we knew about long COVID, and then they updated that with a second review, and this is some information produced by them. So they were looking definitively at what do we know and therefore what research gaps exist that we need to, to fill. And they were very clear that, as has been said, long COVID can be very debilitating um, months after the initial infection. We now know more than a year. 71% of respondents in their own survey said long COVID was affecting family life. You know, it's hard enough being a working mum or a working dad, you know, but to try and balance your long COVID recovery, your um, family and your job is incredibly difficult. And then we're also finding that um, slightly more women than men are getting long COVID. Definitely more women than men are doing a lot of caring responsibility in the home during the pandemic. Um, so you could argue, um, and coming as someone with a gender inequality perspective previous to COVID, I have been watching from my couch as progress made with gender inequality and diversity and inclusion in recent years goes backwards. So this is also a diversity and inclusion issue. And as been, as, as been said, 80% of respondents found that long COVID impacted on their work. So this is the biggest mass disabling or impairment causing um, effect or event rather that we've experienced since the flu pandemic in 2018. Next slide, please. So I will leave that information for you to look up afterwards if you're interested in who we are and what we're doing. Um, as I say, we, I'm the chair for one of the, the working groups, there are others, and we are absolutely part of the um, project team that needs to be putting ourselves back together post-COVID. Um, next slide, please. Our purpose, I mean, we basically came together because there was no support for long COVID, there was no understanding of long COVID. And again, we have been told numerous times that we have earned a place at the table when designing services and planning new research. So all of the, the previous speakers did an amazing job and said amazing things, but what they can't tell you is what it's actually like to be a patient and to share the tacit knowledge that we've amassed in closed private groups where we tell people what is really like. And so there is a wider pool of knowledge and information that um, we bring to the table that add to the research that Joe's doing, that add to the perspectives um, that Rachel's commissioning. And we have effectively taken the lead where there was no leadership for people with long COVID. So again, for me and my, my background, I see this absolutely as a leadership opportunity for um, organizations to step up, for HR to step up. And I know what drove me in previous um, roles was to try and make a difference. And uh, I think this is an opportunity as well as a threat for HR, for occupational health, to really look at how we support people with chronic health conditions, not simply long COVID. There have been other chronic ill health conditions before us, but we are the ones who are getting ill right now, who are doctors, who are pharmacists, who are nurses, who are teachers, who are change managers. You know, we bring those collective skills to the, the conversation as well as our lived experience. Next slide, please. And I'm conscious I need to whiz through the last couple. Um, we have been a lifeline for people, and I'll let you read the quotes at your leisure, but that's the sort of thing that needs to be replicated in the workplace to create that protective shield, because people want to leave when they recover and go into the real world, but still need some element of support. And next slide, please. Our values. If, if any of these values resonate with your culture as an organization, you will be well placed to support people with long COVID. Um, we don't conform to typical patient stereotypes in that we are incredibly driven. And this idea of torpor and lying in our beds and doing nothing, we have, I've never been so busy. I've got a full-time job as a patient advocate. Um, what I don't have is the energy to physically 
do all the things I love doing and used to do. So I can talk at length, as you can see. Um, I can write better now than I could at the beginning um, because my brain fog is clearing and I'm getting my cognitive ability back. And I'm working with patients as well to do creative writing to help again, do some sort of therapeutic work to help them find themselves and find their way back to themselves again. People are improving slowly but steadily and need to be cured for carefully. Next slide, please. Now, this was an amazing article I read in June, I think, um, about how to lead in the changing world from the CIPD website. So again, the link is at the bottom and I'll let you follow that up. But this has been my perspective is we are trying to do the biggest change management um, program management um, exercise that we've ever had to do. And I know that HR and occupational health have done an amazing job just keeping the wheels on and keeping things going in you know, to date. So this is the next stage of this is how to kind of look at how to build back equal, how to build back better. And there are lots of people with OD skills who you can bring in. There are people with occupational health skills that you can bring in. It's not about asking the line manager to do everything. It's very much about bringing resources into your HR teams who can help you. Um, as an employment working group, we do lots of things, including support people to take uh, to, to re represent themselves in an employment tribunal where they've been treated incredibly badly um, and very disappointedly, given the, the amount of um, commitment and care that they put into their work because sometimes we you know people who are ill are just seen as a problem to be got rid of and swept under the carpet but we are still there we still have all the qualities that we had before we just have a different way of engaging with things and whilst people were in furlough and whilst we were working from home as Steve said there was a lot of people who were managing but asking people to come back into the workplace and suddenly to transform back into their old selves when they can't do that is going to be a disaster. So we need to be flexible. We need to be listening to people and we need to be trying to find solutions. Uh, last slide, I think. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I love this. I have a friend who's trying to get a job as a receptionist and some of the things they ask in the job descriptions that they want receptionists to do it's like applying to be a brain surgeon you know why don't we focus on what we can do you know you don't have to be brilliant at everything and i might not be able to i'm trying to think of an example um jump on flights down to london and deliver workshops in person without thinking about it but i can do amazing conferences and and zoom um training sessions and so can the others in my employment working group and that's what we're doing we are making ourselves available to be able to support people to rise to this challenge because that's what we need to be doing is working together I will stop there I've clearly gone over apologies please Thank help you so us much. Can... but, but okay. please help us that, that's my final say is you know we need allies we need support we need help but please involve us don't don't try and fix it for us, but involve us. Thank you so much, Leslie, and uh, I am on your vote as a paddock too, and I, I can't relate to this more. I think what this panel reminds us of, and, um, which is really important, is the, the importance of getting together. I mean, here we're experts from different fields. You've got people who suffered from it. You have people who have experienced, um, we've heard today parallels with mental health challenges, other long-term conditions from which we've learned where we've been able to make adjustments. Um, so perhaps um, that, that's an idea to also get together as working groups, whether within your industry or just within your organization. And remember that, um, that the more people you're involved and the more diversity you have on your group, the better you will be able to address this. Um, I'm mindful, we're sharp on time, so we'll just be seven minutes late just to address some of your questions. Um, while I take them out, I'll, I'll start asking some of the questions. If you have any last minute questions, or any employment law questions that we haven't addressed yet, please do submit them through the chat, uh, as we only have a few, a few minutes. Um, I think one of the things that you said, Leslie, is um, how this provide, uh, how COVID, the pandemic in general, has provided us with the biggest opportunity to, and this is something we've been saying over the past year, 
and, and have the biggest opportunity to rethink our practices, our policies, and the way in which we do work and support our employees. Um, we've, we've heard uh, all along, we've heard mental health, we've heard well-being, we've heard about the duty of care of employers and how all of this has become and come back at the center of our preoccupations and on top of, of HR, HR's list, but also really, really a thought for, for leaders today. Um, it brings us back to the biggest lessons learned during lockdown. Um, empathetic leadership and um, support the, the importance of having open communications and, and to create a culture where it's safe for employees to express their concerns and what they suffer from without without having fear of repercussions or it impacting their, their employment altogether. Um, and, and then what we've learned, what, what you've shared with You've shared a lot with us, uh, Joe, in terms of how exactly line managers and organizations can help, and, and so has the rest of the panel. The biggest thing has been flexibility, and the idea that CIPD has championed all throughout that flexibility is never a one size fits, fits all approach, that it is all about individualism and all about, yes, being flexible, but not as a blanket provision, but rather being able to, to adjust. And we have been able to make these adjustments um, to schedules, to teams, to, team, to, to performance management during lockdown and I guess what we are saying is, is perhaps in, in what we're, we're thinking about right now is to not forget these lessons and being able to keep taking them forward I know when I have had like, like you Leslie the, the long COVID I mean fatigue and, and we have Peter today who's talking about who's talking about us and saying that he's joining us from his bed and he's really struggling with long-term COVID he's saying that's up in the chat what I needed is to be able to tell my manager hey listen I can't do a full day right now I need to I need a nap I, I had to tell my manager, I need an app, I'll resume later, but that's what I need right now. And having that ability to say, well, you know, we've done it during COVID. We've, been, we've allowed parents to, you know, end their hours earlier to go and pick up their kids. We've allowed, so we can take some of these lessons and take them forward, even though there is no blanket guidance available as of yet, and we're all kind of learning together. Um, so I hope this brings back a lot of what we've talked about today, but I want to finish on um, bring back to you, Rachel, and back to you, Joe. The biggest question that we've been asked today was around managing attendance uh, and, and absence management. Um, so I know we're developing guidance, but is there anything that you would tell organizations for those who are seeking to, to be flexible, but also still have their previous, uh, their previous uh, um, uh, rules in place and, and, uh, and policies in place? Yeah, I mean, thanks so much, everybody. I've learned so much from what everybody has said. And I think the first thing around absence management, because obviously this is a really core issue for organisations. And I was really struck by research that University of Oxford have carried out showing a very, very low level in the UK of people um, suffering from long COVID who've actually got a formal diagnosis from it. Now, obviously, that's incredibly challenging for the individual, because when you're not well, you, you want to have that diagnosis and you've got all these different symptoms going on and you really don't know what to expect. But that also presents a real challenge for organisations as well, because their absence management processes and procedures and so on. Are, you know, you, you rely and line managers, especially who will be managing day to day absence. They rely on that fit note and that diagnosis and, you know, they, they'll then record it, you know, they'll use a code. But actually, long COVID and the symptoms being so varied, they almost, it, it does defy that kind of process. So, so this really is, as Leslie says, an opportunity for HR to step up and really look at your absence management policies and process and make sure that they really have got that flexibility and that responsiveness in them that you really are guided by that discussion, by that medical advice and by that individual on, an in, on a case by case basis in terms of what support and what they can do. And be wary of using approaches like the Bradford factor that will penalise if, if you have so many short term absences. You might need to, as you just said, Charlotte, I'm just not feeling well, to, you know, I just can't do it today. So we shouldn't be unfairly penalising somebody. So do bring that flexibility and that compassion into your actual absence reporting policies as well. And beware sick presenteeism, as Steve said as well. People who actually should be absent when they're, when they're at work because they, they haven't got that diagnosis or they're feeling under pressure to be there and just carry on when they're collapsing when they go home. 
Yes, thank you so much, Rachel. Is there anything that you wanted to add, uh, Joe? I know you've shared already so much about about it, and uh, and I know a lot of you, a lot of people today will be looking out for for this slide. But is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think just to to really build on Rachel's point there is that element of where are your trigger points and for people with long term conditions for long COVID for mental health for any long term condition if there is um, a meeting with HR after three consecutive extra bits of absence if there is a, a disciplinary after a certain point of time. That means that individual is going to be so worried about that meeting that that distracts from their rehabilitation as well. And so there's a balance between having those things in place to safeguard undue absence and then ensuring that we provide an environment that really is supportive for that rehabilitation. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is to just make sure that our line managers have the autonomy to have conversations and to test and learn. So whatever adjustment you put in might work or it might not and it might work this week but it might not work next month and line managers that have the confidence to have those conversations and feel skilled to do so are much more likely to create that environment that will help people stay at work which means that they're likely to thrive in their careers and keep their careers can I just add, I think we've got to be very careful that attendance policies don't drive sick presence in safety critical roles, particularly amongst drivers, high pressure decision makers and those that are working in hazardous environments, because that pressure to stay at work may actually mean that that's absolutely the wrong thing to be doing. I agree, Stephen. When we, we did a survey of our members to find out the impacts on the wider um, life and, and work, um, a majority of people who responded were healthcare workers so they're under huge pressure as we go into the next wave of the pandemic to be back at work on the ground and um, having to do 12-hour shifts and you know work with their colleagues so a big part of this is about looking at the whole team and the whole system and not just saying to one person but you're a critical person you have to be in there because as you say imagine if someone goes in and does a job where they make a mistake and that costs something you know someone their life if, if they're a train driver or a healthcare worker it doesn't bear thinking about the other thing i was going to just add to what rachel was saying you know this takes me right back to the basics of management development you know one of the first um, management development models we introduce managers to is mcgregor's theory x and y where we have an implicit bias where we either see people as inherently wanting to work or not wanting to work as inherently self-motivated or lazy. And it's this is what disability does to people. It triggers bias in when we are in crisis as well. Even if we've learned good management techniques, we still go back to our default position, which is what do we trust? And if we think if I let my people work from home, they'll just be sitting watching Netflix all day. Um, you know, you're going to find a different dynamic than if people are like okay well the team know what they're doing i'll get them to you know we'll, we'll arrange weekly one-to-ones so that we can find out what's happening um you know it 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 creates a different culture so the point joe made about if people feel they're being disciplined and this is the kind of wor words that are being used if people are being pulled up and um, on capability being disciplined as opposed to I'm getting support from my line manager. I'm getting support from my employer. My employer is trying to find ways in which we can find ways for me to get a diagnosis or an assessment because the NHS is not able to do that. Maybe we can look at the healthcare provision that HR has put in place for workers. You know, so again, it's about being solution focused and seeing, not seeing the person as the problem. Come to me comes all the way back to theory X and Y, and we need to remind ourselves that the person in front of you is not trying to be difficult. They're actually trying their best. Um, and Absolutely. that would be the, the last Sorry, thing I, I, would I have to, to cut you off. Thank you so much, Leslie, for, for this. And um, again, a really important one that we've learned during COVID. We've learned to understand, to build trust within employees. And it's just not to forget all those ways and try to rush back into, into our old ways of working. Thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Um, it's, been, it's been really a pleasure talking to you today. Um, thank you for those who have joined us today. The recording will be made available on cfd.co.uk. Um, please don't follow us on LinkedIn and our social media if you wish to get the slides as well. 
Um, you will also find a contact of Rachel and Joe who are conducting research on the topic. Um, we'd love for you to share your experiences, whether you've been a patient, whether you've set up provisions or policies, um, anything that has worked or hasn't worked for that matter, that would be really helpful and help us collectively frame solutions for the community. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.